So, one of my favorite great cultural theologians, Black Eyed Peas, has a song, and it goes like, I got a feeling, and what was the next part? Shame on you, you guys all know that. Tonight's gonna be a good night, tonight's gonna be a good night. Well, I think that's actually what the whole song's about. Tonight's gonna be a good night, and um, I think this song, defines a, the propensity, that means uh, in direction, okay, if you don't know what that means, uh, of our generation toward orgasmic experiences. If you don't know what that means, look it up. Um, or just experiences in general, feelings in general. Uh, we, we want that feeling, uh, maybe I should just sing that part of the whole sermon, right? Uh, that's why weed is the drug of this generation. It's the drug of choice. Because people want that feeling all the time, right? There's movies centered around Amsterdam and weed, right? I, you know, maybe in this generation, the future uh, Congress people will legalize it, and it won't be, you know, illegal anymore, even though I'm against it. Just letting you know my <laughs> point of view. But who knows? There's, there's drugs named ecstasy. We really like that feeling, right? And um, if you continue to look in, you know, in all metropolitan areas, you know, the lounge business, the club business, they're booming. But just like they boom, they, they fade like, I don't know, like in a year. Actually, if you really look at this generation, commitment to anything is lackluster, right? Think, think of this, TV shows, clubs, relationships. I know some people, when I was growing up, that were going out forever. Now, I mean, you know, you, you, I ask someone like, you know, the kids, you were going out? Yeah. How long? A day. <laughs> Is there over already? Yeah. Why? She took a fry. <laughs> I, I mean, it's ridiculous. People... Commitment is, 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 is you know, non-existent today. It ends like TV shows, I know, heroes being asked. Because if not enough people watch it, if not enough people don't have to get that feeling, <laughs> it's out. Yeah? If we were to define our generation, the generation we live in, perhaps the smartest generation in history, don't, don't feel too good about yourself, I'm gonna break you down. <laughs> it would be called a mobile generation. Why mobile? How many people have a mobile in their pocket? Yeah, yeah. in church you're supposed to say, Amen, or oh yeah, which is equivalent. Now, mo mobility is the single fact that many of you have the control and the power to not stay at something that you don't want to for a long time. If you don't like something, what do you do? You exit, right? If you don't like a video, what do you do at home? Like, you're watching one of my sermons. Oh, that's the same thing. Yes. <laughs> Shut up. I know you dare not say to me in my face, but I bet you talk to me in my video, don't you? <laughs> Why are you laughing? Is that true? <laughs> but, you, yeah, when you don't like something, you have the mobility to be able to no longer commit to it. YouTube, Facebook, email, you know, whatever. It's mobile. You have the mobility to move away from pain, to move, move away from conflict, to move away. And now if you're dating someone from an online site, you don't like that what they said so you could date someone else from eHarmony or whatever. The mobility is a great problem in our generation simply because it adds to the already superficiality that we possess in our generation. So it's not that the, the, you know, the quality of things to commit to, they're numerous. The problem is we become so hollow, so shallow in our character, that it's almost impossible to commit to something through the storm. I think uh, Eminem just wrote a song. I, this one was pretty good. Yeah, you agree with that? You like that one, you like that one. You like this song? You listen to this song? You pagan. <laughs> okay, but, but you get what I'm saying? 
The problem is there is great shallowness. Forget about being a you know, follower of Christ. You're here today. You know, your friends force you to come. Say, hey, you need to come to my church. My church is pretty cool. And you came. And you know, you're, you're, you're fighting what this church thing is all about and what gospel is about and what Christ is all about. We're just talking about the contextualization of our culture. We're just talking about our culture, the state of our generation being shallow, superficial. It's a curse of our generation. Right? That's why guys continue to look and, and girls continue to look at other other sides of outfit sex. This is why, I mean, there's a book I read one time that said, um, you know he's not the one. You know what that book is about? The first page says, This is why all girls are pissed. They look mad all the time. Because they know they're not they're not with the one they really want to be. You know, they're they're settling. And that's why they're always upset when you call them, why are you calling me? Because they know that he's not the one. You know, they're just settling. They're just cruising. And guys, they're not with the one they always want to be with. That's why they're always looking, you know? <laughs> oh, you, you know, like the Corona commercial? <laughs> and, she and she splashes on his ear. And so the great problem in our generation is the shallowness of that, that comes with mobility. And the problem is... When you become a Christ follower, which many of you have in the last year or months or weeks, is that the gospel is not simply about God loving us. How many people know God loves us? Amen. Tell someone, God loves you. Smile and say, God loves you. Aren't you glad? Oh, yeah. And people think that the gospel is basically about God loving me. Oh, God loves me. God thinks I'm special. And there's all these pastors that say, you know, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. You're so awesome. You're so freaking great. You're awesome. God giving you gifts and talents and opportunities. You're so wonderful. The gospel is not about simply a a declaration of God's love for us, he's shown on the cross, the gospel is also about an invitation to a relationship with the one that loves us. Now, if I ask you, do you know God loves you? And you go, yeah. But then when, you, when it takes us to love God and to follow God, that's a whole different story, isn't it? To love God, to love someone, to love anything to, means commitment. To commit something means sacrifice. To sacrifice means pain means turmoil. Now, Christ sacrificed all. He left mobility, the option to move away from pain and enter pain to come and love us. Can we? Can we love God that way? Because the Bible says in Matthew 22 that God so loved, no, that's Matthew 3, confused. Let's cut that part out of the video, okay? <laughs> Kidding. Um, so, um, what was I saying? Okay, I'm back now. It's Matthew 22. It says, love the Lord your God with what? All your heart. No, no, what's the first word? All. <laughs> all. all. Say all. 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 What does all mean? Everything. Everything. See, God, the gospel is not simply about Jesus dying on the cross for you. It's also about our response. Yes. God loves us. The cross makes it very clear. But does our life and the way we live it and the way we follow him make it clear that we love him? Oh, that's a different story. That's a painful question, isn't it? Because the truth is, not many of us really love God. We love ourselves. We like to go, God, we go, Jesus, tell me about the part that you love, about you loving me. Don't ask me if I love you. Nah, I don't want to talk about that. That's, that's later. But the truth is, the gospel is about a response for us loving him. There has to be a reciprocal. It can't just be one way. That's not a relationship. That's not real. So if you want to really love God and you want to really follow God, and if you're searching for God right now, I mean, what's the point of committing to something if you're not going to follow through with it anyway? Oh, well, you're telling me the gospel is actually about a relationship? Yes. The gospel is actually about loving God? Yeah. You know What do you think Jesus meant? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. You know what that actually one word compasses all that? You know what that really means? It means worship. It's like, you know, some of you, when you fall in love with a girl, you worship her. You build an altar. You never did that before? <laughs> you said what? 
It's about worship. It's when you are in fascinated, you get a vision, and you love the person so much, you can't live without them. Now, that a lot of times in our culture, in all the rap songs, and all the hip-hop songs, and Z100, all they talk about is sex and body parts. But what the love I'm talking about is a sacrificial type, a comprehensive commitment through the storm, how to warm, whenever. So we have to deal with this issue of shallowness. So where is the gospel? How does the gospel, how does Jesus deal with our shallowness, our superficiality? How does God take us, not simply be recipients of his love, but how does the gospel come and help us love and become deeper people so we love God and then do the second greatest commandment and love other people? Because everybody in this room, and you guys are just, you know, what? Yeah, effed up. Messed up. You can't. That's how the gospel changes us. It changes us from superficial people to deeper people. And only the gospel could do that. So let's, let's ask that question here and go to this text. Stu, you read it for us. How many people were lost when you read it? Do I need to go again? Everybody, if you get the story, say amen. amen. Say oh yeah. Oh yeah. Stu, I guess you were good. Okay. So, so let me say, put the set in here for you. Okay. We're at, what, what chapter of Genesis are we at? 28. Yes, chap Genesis 28. Last week we were in Genesis 13. We're fast forwarding back. Now remember, the story of Genesis is about who first? About who? God. No, not God. Come on. It's not, it's like Jesus. <laughs> the first person in Genesis we really talk about, the story of, of redemption is with who? What man? Named Abraham. Who said Moses? We're not even there yet. We're not there yet, people. The most ignorant generation, biblically. No. So you have, first you have Abraham. Abraham is promised a son when Sarah is barren. And a miracle child, Isaac, comes out from that family. And the God of Abraham and Isaac, and now we come to Jacob. And we were on Jacob for a little while. Now you need to understand Jacob as a very superficial guy. Because right now, guess where he's going? You didn't read that story yet in 27. You guess where he's going right now? It's, he said he's on a journey, right? Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I'm taking, will give me food and eat clothes to wear, right? He goes on this journey. You know what journey he's on right now? He's not running away. He's on a journey to find a wife. Okay? He's looking for a hot one. So he left his father's house, commanded by Isaac to find a wife. So right now, like all of you, so pay attention. He's going for that spouse. Now, he's shallow too. I mean, when we read the next chapter, you're gonna be like, what, this guy's shallow. You know, the first time he meets his wife, he kisses her. And he weeps. <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get there, I know. It sounds like someone I know, but I mean, so, I mean, um, Seriously, so we come to this place, he's looking for a wife, and this is what happens. He gets this dream, right? The dream of going to heaven. And so he goes, how awesome is this place? This is no other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And look what happens. Verse 20. Then Jacob made a wow. saying. If. Verse. If. Now come on, say that aloud. If. If, if is what? What kind of statement is that? A. A conditional statement. So, look at how shallow this dude is. He sees heaven. He says, how awesome is this place? Oh, I've seen God. And he goes, and then the, the experience, the dream, the vision doesn't affect his commitment to God at all. He, and he goes, he completely forgets about the dream. And he says, then Jacob made a vow saying, if God condition will be with me, it's all about me. And we will watch over me again on this journey I'm taking and will give me. Is this guy shallow or what? <laughs> give me, me, me journey, right? And, and look, give me, give me what? No, 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 come on. I'm taking and will give me. Come on, you people like that part. Come on now. Yours is your favorite part, right? He will give me food to eat and clothes to wear. Someone say, oh yeah. Oh yeah. You guys like that? No. 
give me clothes to wear. This sounds like a lot like us. And um, so then I will return safely, C1 security, to my father's house. Then, so I got here's my list. Then the Lord will be my God. And then this, what? So God, look what I'm going to do for you. Look, look, listen, this is the deal, all right? You're going to give me all this, I'll give you this stone. I'll give you this rock. I prayed, I prayed with you. It's, it's, a, it's a holy rock for you, right? That I have set up as a pillar. Pillar is a big word for the, just this one rock. All right? And this rock will be your house. You can live in this house anytime you want. This will be your house. I'll make a door for you. I'll draw an imaginary door. I mean, right? It will be your house. And it goes, it will be God's house. And I want all this. And all that you give me, I will give you a... Oh, look, he's about to give something back now. He's giving something back. So look at the shallowness of Jacob, which a lot of us are like, very similar in his relationship with God. Though he had a spiritual experience, although he grew up, in a legacy of faith, when Isaac, who was a miracle child, when his grandmother was barren, but had him, but yet, Jacob's commitment to God did not come into fruition. Or even in this passage, it, he's only open to the idea of God, and loving God, and really following God. There's a big difference, isn't there, of believing in God, and what? Following God and loving God. There's a big difference between being loved by God and loving God, isn't there? You see, so many people want spiritual experiences. The, the question is, did this experience help Jacob come into God? Did it? He, had to, he said, it's awesome, and he did a really awesome worship song. You know, there's actually a worship song that comes from that. You know, you are awesome in this place, Almighty God. That's, you, know, you know that's a song, right? Okay, you like that? It's carry a free character for you right there. That's a worship song. Jacob is singing a worship song to God, yet his commitment to God is super shallow. Super duper shallow. Because he believes in God, he just says, then you will be my God. You will be, then you will be my God. Conditional. A lot of people in this room, like a lot of us, we want this feeling. <laughs> you know, we want this feeling. We, we, we want this orgasmic, ecstasy type of feeling, and then we'll follow God. We'll follow people. Then we'll love. I mean, I know people in this room, and you guys are very naive about this, but please, listen. There is no love in first sight. <gasps> I broke your little hearts. <laughs> I broke your heart. Sorry, man. There's no love for sight. There's no, there's no love for sight. Sorry. I apologize. You need a hug? You need a hug, Tony? <laughs> there's no love for sight. I mean, I know people that are like going to be in their, that, that could go into their 40s and 30s looking for that one. Like, if you want to get married, you have to like date somebody. Like, that's like the first step, you know? It's not like that look where you look at them and it's like, oh, you know, it's like, wow, this is, this is amazing. Like, wow, I feel for you. You know, that's just lust, people. Okay? That's called lust. Okay? If you see no flaw in that person, you're in a delusion. Because everybody is what? Effed up. Everybody, you think, you know, they have apex and, you know, pecs here and they look, you know, and she's amazingly beautiful. Just wait until she annoys you or he farts in the car. <laughs> Perfection out the window. I mean, if, if, if he farts and you're like, oh, he's, he farts perfect, then you need help. You need help. You need Jesus, like, to the 10th power. 
Seriously. I mean, I mean, and everybody gets crushes now and then, you know? I mean, seriously, you get crushes. Feel, and I, I don't want, I don't want to, you know, diminish feelings. Feelings are great, you know, romantic, you know? You want to live in that mode, you know, that's good stuff, you know? But I've been married for seven years, I know what the real deal is, okay? I know what real intimacy is, right? And, and the farting thing, that's, that's, that's true. That's what my wife says to me, no, I'm kidding. Now, now seriously, just because you feel things for another person doesn't mean that relationship will grow or last. Doesn't. That means that all of you who, holds, who held someone's hand, the opposite sex, you know, and you, you know, the first time you held their hand, it's like, oh, wow. Can you believe that? What kind of feeling is that? I got the feeling, right? I mean, seriously, that is amazing. You want to hold my hand? I mean, that's amazing, right? And it, it, that feeling is a, an invitation to something that could be something good, but it's an invitation. It's not an affirmation of a relationship. And this is something that you have to understand spiritually. Many of you in this room have experienced God. Some of you have dared God to do trooper dupa loops, and he didn't. You ask God to show up in your life, and he didn't. He showed up in a way that's undeniable. You can't say, well, that was a coincidence. God knew. He just shut you up. He existentially shattered your life. Now, that's an invitation. That's an affirmation of your spiritual maturity. That's not an affirmation of how cool or awesome you are. Oh, I'm so special. God answered my prayer. Dude, God answers everybody's prayer. Like, you know, he, God, like, listens to everybody. Oh, I thought he just listened to me. Only I hear God. No, idiot. That's just arrogance. So spiritual experiences do not affirm your relationship with God. It's an invitation to something more. Like Jacob. So this is something you need to understand. Some of you are there right now. You've experienced God. You know God's real. You know. But check it out. Okay. So where is the gospel here? How does God deal with the gospel deal with our shallowness? Well, first... What God wants us to know, what Jesus wants us to know is very simple. Okay, first, what? Experiences what? Do not Necessary. produce. Necessary. Now, I'm not, listen, I'm not knocking on spiritual experiences, okay? Hey, knock yourself out. You know? But, listen, I, I've been a pastor for 10 years or over 10 years now, and I've seen people cry, fall down on the floor, twitch. <laughs> um, and listen, and I don't, I don't doubt those experience, all of those experiences as a work of God's spirit. Okay? Some of them are legitimate. But those experiences do not necessarily affirm your commitment to God. It doesn't even produce. It's God just saying, I'm here. How many people know that God's here? Amen. Because you're a dumbass if you're here on Sunday... You should be watching the game or something else, barbecuing outside, if God's not alive. I mean, you know it. Those experiences were the appetizer. They were the invitation to God's purpose for your life, God's love for your life. So, please, if you have a spiritual experience, okay, whatever, whatever you're still, you went to heaven, all right, fine. All right, you, you, you felt God's presence, you twitched, whatever you did, the manifestation of the Spirit, great. You heard God's voice internally, whatever you did. You still, in the end of the day, that experience doesn't bring you commitment. You have to choose for that, right? So, here, my question is this. Are you, in your, in your relationship with God right now, or you're seeking God right now, are you still at the, the stage of shallowness, like Jacob, where you go, if and when you, God, if you do this, God, when you do this, God, when you give me this, God, when you send me this, God, then I, you will be my God. If that's where you're at, then you're not committed to God. You're not, you don't love God. You love yourself. That's, like, that's the pocket Jesus. That's the pocket God. You want to carry him around everywhere. Because it's conditional. Last time I checked, love is like supposed to be like what? Unconditional? Like, right? Maybe? I mean, do you want your parents to say, listen, if you don't, if you don't get all A's, I don't love you. <laughs> but then everybody here wouldn't be loved. 
Some people are like, I got all A's. Well, they still don't love you because they want you to become something better than that. Seriously, right? So love has to be unconditional. But the problem is, a lot of us have so many conditions to God. When God loved us unconditionally, when he died on the cross, when he left the mobility from heaven, from his throne, he came down because he loved us without any cost. Without sparing any cost. He loved us. Do we love him? No? Good. Let it hurt. Rub it in. Tell him, you don't love God. Right? It hurts. Let it hurt. Let it sting. Because that's when change happens. Okay? So let's go down here. Next. So when does the change really happen? What is the most spiritual thing you could do? QT? <laughs> Where you get a daily bread and you like, or you know, get a daily bread and you read like for one and a half minutes. And you know, people say, I, my, I spend my time with God. I read a verse and read something and I think it applies to my life. Well, you know, 365 times a year, I mean, something's going to apply to your life. <laughs> or, you know, you open a Bible and you go, God, speak to me. You know, you read a verse. I mean, I mean, what is the most spiritual? Is, is prayer the most spiritual thing? You know, you close your eyes and you pray, oh, God, I love you. Let us adore you. Let us love you. Let us celebrate you. Let us, let us. God doesn't like vegetables, people. I mean, I mean, I'm serious. I mean, seriously, is prayer the most spiritual thing? I mean, what changes, what changes Jacob's consideration, the possibility of him allowing God to be Lord of his life? Because, you know, God can be God but not Lord of your life. Because you can believe in God and not follow him or love him. Well, what, what, what did it? And the key word here is what? Then Jacob made... What's a vow? A choice. Choice is the most spiritual thing you can do with your life. Because if you want to pray, you got to what? Choose. Choose to pray. The problem is not that people don't know they should pray. They just don't want to pray. Because, you know, you go to your room and you go, you know, you're smoking, you're smoking, you make it happen. And, and, you know, she sits on the third row. And you come back and you're watching. You've prayed like 15 seconds. <laughs> Right, then you're like, okay, I gotta pray more. And so, you know, you, you, you pray, but the greatest spiritual muscle you can develop to commit to God is what? It's choosing. You have to choose. You wanna fast? People think they're spiritual because they fast. <laughs> Fasting is not the spiritual part. I did it before, I swear to God. <laughs> three day fast. I drank three yous, though. So. <laughs> That's a liquid fast, though. It's a liquid fast. God knows my heart, people. But seriously, fasting, you have to choose to fast. You have to choose to pray. You have to choose to read the Bible. You have to choose to go to church. You have to choose to go to a small group. Choice is what makes you commit. That's the spiritual muscle that makes you love God. When you know that something is against the conviction of God in your spirit, and you're in a situation, in a temptation, in a moment, what you choose Shows if you love God or not, if you're going to follow God or not. Because if you follow God and choose God when it's easy, that's just conditional. Yeah? Seriously. There has to come a point in everybody's life where you have to choose. Listen, you're not going to get a crazy vision where you go to heaven. So, well, I hope maybe one of you or two of you have it. I hope not everybody, because that might be weird. But no, I'm serious. You're not going to get a spiritual you know, vision. You're not going to hear the audible voice of God. Because many of you in this room already know that God's alive. And God's shown up in your life. At the end of the day, it's really simple. It's really basic. You're going to have to choose to make God Lord of your life. Because He's God. Because He loves us. Amen? Amen. Simple as that. Right? That's when, you know, this is what I realized. <clears throat> How many people know when you're about to get, you know, when you're, you know, especially the men, you need, guys, you need to know this. I'm a teacher. I, I, I'm, I'm sure by the time you're engaged, it's going to go up more in value. But do you know how much the ring is supposed to be? Too much. Too much. Kai, you're never getting married. <laughs> you know, you know, Mr. T, I pity the fool. I pity. I mean, is, I mean. The dog. I mean, seriously, I, I, when, I, when I was going to get married, my, I asked around, I mean, you know, how much is a ring? Because, you know, I thought, you know, if you get those, if you get any ring, you know, come on, it's all about love, right? <laughs> nah. 
This is definitely about stuff. Right? Tiffany's, I, I still believe Tiffany's is from the devil. Um, but I, I thought it was like three weeks salary, three weeks wage. You know, I'm like, three weeks wage? That's a lot of money. I'm like, she, you know, she's lucky that she's married for one week in wage. You know, come on, marry me. And it's not like that. The ring is not about me. The ring is about her, right? And then I heard, you know what, you know what the equivalent rate wage is for engagement ring? Three months! You got, I said, you gotta be, I'm not getting married. <laughs> Three months? Three months? Really? I mean, how many people really have one month's wage saved up? I mean, one month allowance saved up. Well, Matt, there you go. You're allowed to get married. <laughs> I mean, seriously, three months. I mean, seriously, when I went to buy the ring, I was like, <laughs> I'm like, really, I'm gonna buy this. I'm gonna buy the shiny thing for this much money. I mean, it costs you basically. After I bought the ring, I, ha I had no clothes left. <laughs> I mean, seriously, it costs that much. But commitment cost you. You know, seriously, you. Nothing is officialized until that ring is on the finger. No thing until you have that ring. Right? She could do this to you all you want. You know, she, she don't have to believe that you, you go, a guy can say, I love you, baby, I love you, baby. And she can say this. Three months wage. Right? If it's worth that much to commit, then it works then you know that you're going to commit. Commitment costs you that. Jesus committed to us. Sacrificed everything. Today the question is, real simple, and perhaps a lot of us need to repent of this, and say, God, I'm sorry for being so such a douchebag. God served me so selfish. In which everybody in this room, just wanted to let you know I'm talking to you, not people outside or watching on YouTube, just you and me. And when I have to say, the question is, or are you, do you really, the question is, are you, do you just believe in God, or do you really, are you really following God? Ah, it's always that way. And, and, and I, you know, people tell me all the time, you know, when I, when I preach about these things, they, they go, Pastor Sam, dude, stop being so judgmental. I'm like, how am I being judgmental? You're making, you're asking me if I love God and stuff. I mean, don't, when I, when I say, do you love God, people say this to me. Why are you trying to question God's love for me? I'm like, are you stupid? I'm not talking about God's love for you. It's kind of like Shaq's, you know, interview. Like when they, you know, the analyst Shaq. So how do you think the other play, deep, other play, you know, other team play defense on you? Shaq goes, we do. yeah, our team. He's like, yeah, I, like I said, I did my thing. <laughs> I mean, seriously. When I say, when I say, you know, do you love God? I'm not asking you. I'm not questioning if God loves you or not. You go, well, you're saying I messed up, and that's why I don't love God. No, I'm, I'm saying God loves you. Jesus died on the cross. I think it's re you got to be really stupid not to know that God loves you. Right? Jesus made it very clear when he died on the cross. You know how much God loves us? This much, right? He died, and he died. I'm not asking you if God loves you or not. I know you know that. I'm asking you if you love God. Does your life show it? Ah, painful? Deal with it. Okay, so lastly, where how does the gospel deal with our shallowness? Well, the gospel doesn't say, well, well, God loves you, you're awesome, you're special. The gospel doesn't end there. It seeks to transform us and invite us to what? Well, simple. Lastly, the gospel invites us to what? To choose to follow, follow God, not simply believe. because if you just believe, you just believe in a dogma, meaning you're a practical atheist. What's the difference between you and everybody else? 90% of America says they're Christian. 7% says they're not sure, but they lean toward that way. Right? 3% are only atheists that say, well, we don't believe in God at all. You know, like Dawkins, delusion, all that bull, you know? But 97% believe and lean toward saying they, they believe in Jesus. But then when they do a survey, that 90% live no different from the seven and the three. So as I say, everybody believes in God basically, but not everybody loves or follows God. Do you? Do you want to? Let's deal with that. Let's pray together. Stand and pray together. All right, so um, you're going to hear in small groups already, but uh, our retreat, our summer retreat, where we baptize people that have come to Christ and to the family of God, 
It's coming in the second week, the, the last to the second week of August, which is August 20th to the 22nd. Um, we're going to make a deposit in three weeks, so we're going to ask all our members and whoever's going to make a deposit. Um, if you can pay 160 right away, do it. If you can pay half of that, that'll be good because we need to put um, a certain amount of deposit. I think it was $4,000 or something like that. So um, give to your small group leaders as soon as you can. Uh, you're going to get an email, and your small group leaders are going to tell you about that soon. Um, secondly, um, we're going to begin to uh, talk more about the Luzon movement uh, in 180. The Luzon movement was started by Billy Graham in 1974 about uh, reaching the whole world for Christ. And uh, Pastor Lydia and I, um, from our age group, which there was only 40 people selected, invited from thousands of leaders to represent the U.S. 200 countries are, are gathering at Cape Town, South Africa in October. And um, we've been selected at 40 leaders from thousands to uh, participate. So that's, it's a great honor to be there. Um, so, yeah, amen, praise the Lord. Uh, and um, so one of the things that we're going to begin to do is, is give awareness to that. You know, we, we have, you know, most of our major donors, but one of the things they prohibit is to uh, pay for it yourself because they're trying to show churches and people that believe in God the privilege of missions and, you know, the mission of God. So they asked churches and people to find prayer support and financial support. Um, we're going to send an email about this, talk more about it, and give you the whole history of Luzon movement. Uh, there's a basically it's a congress in Cape Town, South Africa. It's the third one of its kind, and Time Magazine says this will be the largest gathering of Christian leaders in history, bigger than Acts 15. You know, when um, James, Peter, you know, we're cooler than those guys right now. And um, so at Cape Town, it's going to be the largest gathering of Christian leaders that are influential in the world. Uh, you know, all, everyone, you know, Billy Graham and, uh, and Tim Keller and um, Rick Warren and all those people are going to be there. And um, we need prayer support for that now. And uh, if you feel, and we're going to say this in our email, if you feel you, you want to have the privilege of giving toward that, I think we're going to raise like $10,000 because uh, plane fare is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, for that, you can. But I want you to not give like $50 on your life because you, you're like, you guilted into it. Oh, yeah, this is cool, so I'm going to give something. But I want you to be convicted by the Lord. I want you to, because it's, it's listen, it's not like we need your money at any word. Uh, we want you to have the privilege of being part of a movement like that. And if you give, be convicted to give and give whatever amount God convicts you to give and that. So you'll get to know more about that in the Luzon movement, but it's a great honor for that, for us to have that opportunity. Um, so those are the two main things that we're going to pray for today. Oh, yeah, an offering. We don't collect it, right? Um, if you remember, give. Site, info booth, or 180church.tv. So let's pray for those three things. Father, we, we want to thank you. You know, as 180 moves into the second year in September, Father, uh, so many people have come to Christ to join the family of God. I mean, we're really good at the turning to Christ part. And we're trying to figure out the living part. Lord, help us to become men and women who really love God in our generation. Not just believe, but follow. So we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, God bless you guys.